Thanks for, for coming, everyone. Um, I think we'll get kicked off so that we've obviously recognised people last time and Paul Rich skills his team. Um, I, just to give people context, this uh, presentation today is one of 25 projects for the Kimberley Marine Research Program, a program funded um, out of state government funding for the Kimberley region. This is the marine portion, we have $12 million worth of funding. Uh, going for this, is leveraged up to about $30 million for across all the programs, and it's across the partners within the West Australian Marine Science Institution. Um, obviously, the project that uh, Scott is going to present about today, is it going to be presenting around, or is no, it the whole team? The whole team. The whole team is going to be presenting part of the project. Um, it's a particularly exciting project because it covers the whole of the Kimberley. A lot of the projects um, are isolated to a very small area of the Kimberley just because of funding or because of access to the region. Uh, Scott's really put a lot of effort into covering all of those regions and particularly to do with the uh, indigenous engagement. So he's engaged with all of the coastal um, saltwater country communities right across the Kimberley. So, and given Scott's experience from the Northern Territory, he's uh, embraced that component of the project really well. So really a standout project. Uh, in the Kimberley Marine Research Program. So Scott's going to provide you a bit of a, uh, a broad overview of that project, and then we'll be meeting with him afterwards to discuss more the management implications of that, because we're finalising the final report for that, and all of this will obviously be available um, on, the, on the website once we finish. So, hand over to Scott. All right, thank you. I'll just start off by acknowledging there are three uh, Wamsley partners here. So our department, UWA and CSIRO, we picked up two additional partners because uh, we could see the value in adding uh, both Kendoli Environmental and Griffith University into the, the mix of partners or collaborators for this project. So these are the, uh, the personnel involved. Uh, you'll see more of those throughout the talk. And we worked with 11 Indigenous partners uh, and these are some of their logos and you'll hear more about their names as we go through. So we did make quite a bit of effort to uh, to make sure that it was a collaborative uh, a, a set of works th through the Kimberley. The other thing I'd like to acknowledge, I guess, are the regional um, department officers, so both both at uh, Kununurra and Broome. Without their help and support, I think we would have really struggled. They bookended the Kimberley for us. They allowed us to uh, fly in, use resources, uh, vehicles, personnel. Uh, they were good contacts in uh, being able to uh, get links into ind Indigenous communities. And, and they were a go-to for, for times when we, we had questions. So can't um, thank those guys enough. Also, through Daryl Moncrief, we got some uh, money, uh, additional money, uh, through the Kimberley Science Conservation uh, Strategy, and that went to some more Indigenous engagement, um, and, and that was really good. The links to the, the project, Northwest Shell Flatback Turtle Conservation Project, which is another project that our group um, worked with, that provided additional money. And we had links in with the herbivory project and the, the geomorphology project. So just to get the context, a lot of people ask why turtles again? You know, turtles are being done all over the place. We do more work on turtles than most other things. And I think it, it is good to get that context. You know, they are highly valued uh, species. They're indigenous values are for cultural uh, reasons. There's food. It is an economic uh, benefit to those groups as well. They do use them uh, for, you know, for meat and it is a good saving through the community. There are other values, they're iconic to most people. Turtles are valued, it doesn't matter whether you live in Sydney or Melbourne and have never seen a turtle, they are valued for most people. Um, we rehabilitate them, they have a threatened status, so a high conservation status. There's a responsibility for states, territories and, and uh, the Commonwealth. Uh, that usually leads to a political value. There is an imperative there to start to manage these species because everyone holds them in a, in a high regard. They then become a priority for management action, and for a lot of these things, it, it leads to a flagship uh, species. So we see NGOs, we see a lot of people using turtles as a flagship species because they link up in the, the different habitats in the environment. Uh, they can be a representative for, um, I guess, a sexier representative for for marine conservation, but they also represent some of the other things. There's common um, common uh, threats and pressures, whether that's pollution, boat strike, you know global warming, whatever it is, turtles can be brought into each of those uh, things with, with some nice photos. So when we scoped the project, when we the, the concept of the Wamsi project first came about, we had to sort of work out what we're going to do. And really we had to sort of focus on what the parameters were needed for management. And that was a really probably the highest priority focus. What do we need in the Kimberley to start to address management issues? 
The other things that came into our equation were the skills of the WAMSI partners. We had three WAMSI partners with, a, with varied and complementing skills and we, we mixed those together to come up with those projects. Indigenous engagement was going to be highly important across the Kimberley. It had to be. If we didn't have that engagement, it wasn't going to work with turtles. There was just no way it could work. Budget came in, of course, because it's a, a huge expanse of coast, and then logistics to get to some of these places. It is just, um, you know, as you know, it's, it's very remote and, and expensive to get to. So we do get the questions of why we picked the, the things we did, and really the, the the thing we needed for understanding or for, for undertaking management, we needed to know. The, the spatial and temporal distribution of nesting across the Kimberley. Nesting is the fundamental unit where turtles come to the same spot. Uh, you know, they have a, a high fidelity to these areas. The census of turtles usually occurs at nesting beaches, and we didn't know what, where, and when these turtles are there. Uh, definition of the genetic stocks, that is a, a management unit of turtles. We are still undefined. Uh, the pressures that are impacting on turtles and how they're going to affect the, the parameters in the future. And for us, the, the indigenous knowledge and how we could actually use that capacity going forward for future management. So those are the four things that we, we picked. We could have done foraging, we could have done connectivity, we could have done hunting. There's a whole list of things we could have done, but we had to rationalise uh, on those previous decision um, criteria. You know, and we're going into a context where this, uh, you know, there, there's limited knowledge for the Kimberley, but it's not nil. You know, there's a prehistory there that goes back more than 40,000 years. There's rock art, there's stories, there's songs. Uh, there's a climate change uh, factor in there where the coast used to be way out to the edge of the continental shelf. So things have changed through time, um, but there are, there's knowledge there. Um, the Macassans and other Eastern Indonesian visitors uh, visited that coast to, from 1700s through to the 1900s. So, and they come for the purpose of uh, turtles included, but also trochus and, and tree pang and fish. There's um, early explorers and settlers. There's information there that goes back to, you know, even looking at numbers of turtles or harvests of turtles in the Kimberley. And so these are all things that, you know, we can use. Even um, there were Dutch traders and pearlers that came, that were based in Kupang that came down to the Kimberley, you know, as late as the nine, early 1900, uh, 1900s. And there's been illegal, um, fishing along uh, the Kimberley coast outside the, the legal Timor box as well, you know, and that has come up, you know, even to quite contemporary times. There are contemporary uh, information, including Woodside, uh, Impex have done major studies in the Kimberley on turtles and, and among other things, but these aren't on a, on a Kimberley-wide scale. They're, they're usually quite focused uh, on uh, around industrial developments. We have connectivity data. There have been major tagging projects done uh, in WA and Queensland, less so in the Northern Territory. But you can see these are the movements of turtles uh, tagged in these other places that have uh, turned up, you know, either on in the Kimberley or have traversed through the Kimberley. So there are other information such as that. And at the time of this project, um, genetic stocks in the Kimberley were pretty well unknown. So for flatback and green turtles, there were major question marks in the Kimberley and hawksbill turtles were really unknown uh, in the Kimberley as well. So that led to the, these four components of the project, which you'll hear about from uh, these other guys. Distribution and abundance of uh, nesting turtles in the Kimberley, the genetics, climate change and increasing temperatures, and indigenous knowledge or, or capacity as well. And I'd just like to emphasise we did we did really try with indigenous engagement, and it, it is a very uh, time-consuming but rewarding uh, you know, uh, place to be. It's, we had early face-to-face -face meetings. Um, we consulted with the KLC and the REACT process. We did individual scopes of works with different groups such as Danby uh, and WG. Uh, we had advice planning trips uh, where we would go and, and work out, um, you know, different ways of doing field work. Uh, we budgeted for wages and engagement fees and communication products. And uh, we worked with 10, 11 groups, and, and Tony and Blair were probably on most of those trips, uh, where we actually had a lot of uh, training and capacity building as well. So I'll hand it over to these other guys now, who will continue on, and I'll just wrap up a couple of things right at the end. I'm going to cover the part where we are doing an inventory of the distribution and abundance of, of uh, turtles 
And this is basically Kelly Pendoli's efforts that we arranged to photograph most of the Kimberly and my efforts to try to make sense of all the photographs. As we began um, this project, there was a new emphasis on Kimberly marine turtle resources that came from three things. The establishment of new marine parks, the development of ranger groups responsible for own country management, and just recently the 2017 Commonwealth Marine Turtle Recovery Plans. All of those caused us to realize we needed to be able to provide information both in a landscape and a local context. So our challenge was to craft a marine turtle inventory that would strategically combine the best of two to uh, dimensions, the temporal and spatial dimensions. So the maximum dimension in the spatial scale might be achieved by multiple aerial surveys and the maximum dimension in the, the temporal scale would be uh, dealt with by the very, very long traditional knowledge. You've seen this probably a few times. But what we wanted to emphasize was that the red arrow indicates that turtles are one of the uh, 25 different projects, but it's the one that's the most cross-cutting. The ones of the TO groups that with active ranger groups, I would emphasize, it's not that we omitted these groups, but we had ranger groups that we could work with that are outlined here. And that gave us an opportunity to begin to ask those inventory questions that are shaped by the vast, vast scales that we're dealing with in the Kimberley. So really basically, where are these turtles nesting? When are they nesting? Because nesting in the Kimberley encompasses both summer and winter seasons. And that may entail different species at those times. And then how many turtles and where are they placed? And that's a fairly simple set of questions, but trying to make that happen for a remote coastline and places you can only get to by foot, boat, chopper, or in some cases, float planes was a challenge. There are also some other challenges to be aware of, which is the effects of variability. For example, the two major species we look at, flatback counts are not consistent from night to night. Over the course of a fortnight, you would find that they like the dark phases of the moon and not so much the moderate tide. So you have to conduct a survey over at least a two week period to, to have a reliable census. The green turtles as the other primary species that we, we see there also have a, a factor that they have alternating periods where one year is followed of high nesting activity is followed by a lower activity. So we had to uh, deal with the temporal variability and Take it that a mid-season snapshot would be a reliable proxy for what we were trying to do, just get counts of turtles. Um, the mid-winter sample and the mid-summer sample are going to be hopefully long enough periods of times that we could pick the middle of those to get a fairly reliable picture. In our inventory, we had a seven step process to take uh, us from what we knew to the incorporation of new knowledge. So I'll take you through those each, but they are modeling, flight planning, image capture, reviewing those images, turning that Im information into GIS products, distilling that into something that we can use for management advice, and then communicating that back to our ranger groups. So in our predictive model, as Scott mentioned earlier, we have indigenous knowledge sharing that goes past millennia, and that is good up to the present date. We compiled the history that we could find in early maritime explorers and surveys because they often will keep track of a place or a remarkable number of species that they happen to observe in their explorations. Moving closer to the present day, our Coast Watch uh, aerial surveys of the, the northern coastlines have been um, archived for years and years by Dr. Bob Prince. And then uh, in the, starting in the 2000s with the interest in industrial exploration, there were some aerial explorations, but they were very spa spatially discreet and not what we were after, which was across the entirety of the Kimberley. 
And finally, coming up to the present day, we could use things like remote sensing that would take into account all of our images. And we could use things like white reflectance values, what we will call them as sand pixels, as a way of picking out the targets that we want to link. So what we began with Kelly's expertise, who had done some of this work in uh, the Kimberly, or sorry, yeah, the lower Kimberly, is trying to find a way to link all of the white pixels, the white sandy reflectance values from beaches, and um, to arrange a flight path, as you see in the lower right there, that it actually takes linking all of those white sandy pixels, that's about an eight day flight um, to get from refueling spot to refueling spot and to keep going. So we tried to arrange that so that we could do that um, in a way that ar arranged the plane over each of the sandy beaches and that we could record and later inspect the images. I'm going to not bludgeon you with data, I hope, and give you a really quick picture of what we found. The yellow dots you see here are all the summer um, nests at that scale of the Kimberley, and the red dots are the winter tracks that you see from the Dampier Archipelago all the way on up. Dampier Archipelago, the uh, Dampier Peninsula. And what we find is that the summer and winter crossover is basically right there along the, the, the tip of Cape Levique. One of the other take home messages, real, data really, really boil down is what are the highest density rookeries? So if you were to go out in the summer or if you went out in the winter, you would get a different answer because we've got different species that are utilizing different seasons. So if you went to the Lassipedes, sorry, the blue, you might find some nesting in both summer and winter, but obviously if you're trying to survey there, that's your value time to go for that species. And similarly, for Cape Domet, you only go in the winter. This is the picture of Cape Domet with a three meter Crocker scale. And uh, you find almost no tracks at all if you go re return to that same beach. Again, trying to compress a lot of data into a small space here, what we did was took our information and compressed it onto a log logarithmic scale. So on the scale of ones, tens, hundreds, and thousands, whether we're talking about the track counts or the density on the y-axis and the winter tracks data at the top, the summer data at the bottom. What you'll notice is that there are, I'm going to use the terms sparse, common, abundant, and aggregated batches, depending upon whether you're talking about each of those log scales. What we're wanting to discuss is that at a management scale, we're probably mostly interested in, in those that are at the medium to large scale or the very common to abundant scale. And those that are head and shoulders above the rest. And you'll notice that Cape Diamond, the Lassipedes, and 80 Mile are in those areas. But we are also faced with a problem, which is there may be so many tracks there, you can't simply count them accurately. And at this scale, you may be talking about so few animals on a beach that it's really difficult to entail the effort to go there unless you know that those are very, very rare turtles, and that may indeed be the case. I'll return to that point. But this gives us a way of looking at management options about what are important, how, how do we define important? The other component is whether the summer and winter priorities fall into our marine parks or whether they fall into the traditional owner boundaries, because whether you're managing across the Kimberley or whether you're managing just in Karajari country matters to that group a lot, but probably not so much what's happening up in the Northern Kimberley. So we wanted to tailor our information to the TO partners that we're working with. Again, finding the hot spots within a ranger group's saltwater country is very important to them 
uh, if you're wanting to look at Cassini Island, you might want to know what are the important beaches to go to that when you get ready to sample for the uh, genetics or whether you get ready to go there and sample for eggs. And so this, this was a really important component that was a foundation for some of the other um, regions. So to set a question like that with, that with that landscape focus, the entire Kimberley focus, and your focus on the 100 to 1,000 end of the scale, what's the most important Kimberley rookery? Well, I've answered that question already for you, but the question is it depends on which species you're talking about, and it depends also on what, uh, what spe species and what season you're talking about. You uh, would also ask the question, if you're a manager, is it, is it feasible for me to get there and is it affordable for me to get there? And so that answer you would like to think would be the same, but it might not always be that. We'll return to that in a little bit. So this is my really crude version of an animation here. And it, again, is the, the dots chopped into sections of the Kimberley. So the section that covers 80 mile, the... Uh, the, the archipelago, and then there's the Buccaneer Archipelago, and then here's from Camden Sound on up. There's the North Kimberley, and then there's the part that uh, goes into the Buccaneer Archipelago. What you'll see, red, yellow, and green are high, medium, and low priorities for the summer. And if you've got that scheme in mind, we're going to look at two more slides that have this same layout. This is summer. We're now going to look at winter, and then we're only going to look at priority. So that's the structure. There's winter, and you see that there is a slight change, but as I now take away the medium and low for both and give you the summer and winter together, you see that that's still a lot of information to visually process. So I've made that into this. This is called a, uh, a version of quantitative presentation of data, and the size of the font there is spatially, uh, sorry, is proportional to the size of the data. So in the summer, the Lassipedes and 80 Mile are the two important rookeries to concentrate on. On the right side of the slide, representing the winter, East Cape Dummett is the most spatially important to, to look at. But you'll notice there are quite a few more of those medium-sized uh, rookeries that are around there. And I guess that's maybe your take-home message is there are, are a lot of things to consider. Which do you wish to consider? This is where the managers will probably take us into a smoky room at the end mm -hmm. of our, meet, our talk today and ask about things like, well, Turtle density is one thing, but what about distance from play, a place of work or the budget you have to do this sort of work or the field time or the personnel and particularly the TO engagements in terms of whether they're in healthy country or in indigenous protected area or within or outside of uh, marine parks. And I'm not going to go into the detail of this, but we did go into that and we will be happy to discuss that with the managers when they get us in that area. So here's our distilled advice if we're doing this again or going to do this again in the Pilbara, for example. We would plot our rookeries by log log abundance and density for the summer and winter and then perhaps look at the top five. We'll identify the large to extra large categories of common species because those are important from a management scale but we also want to ask the question about, should we be looking at small to medium categories? For example, most all of the work that we pushed here, our results have been green turtles and flatbacks, but hawksbills and olive ridleys are also important in this, but they're not there in the numbers. But it, the important a further me message is that we need to be able to pair the local ranger groups who are interested in their scale of management with landscape scale. So these will be our recommendations for each of those management groups. If we're looking at the, man, the, the landscape scale, we're fortunate in those three important places already have some data. The other ones that are outlined here for each of those 
11 TO groups have less work done and there's more yet to be doing. One of the other components is that we did an evaluation for nesting beaches not in water work. And the rightmost column identifies where in water work is ongoing or has potential. So that will be a springboard for further work. So that was our uh, information and these are some of our outputs. Scott, I think you're going to probably cover some of this again. And so I'll just say that these are some of the things that we produce and we'll be sharing with our managers as well as our TOs. Thanks, Hi, everyone. I'm going to um, take a step sideways and maybe towards a more narrow, narrow, narrow focus here. I'm going to talk about where turtles go. Um, of course, turtles, these iconic creatures, most of our interactions with them are when they come to shore to nest after 20 years of, of growth from, a, from an egg. Um, and of course, they're famous for returning this high fidelity to their nesting beaches. And we know that because <coughs> of tagging efforts. Um, and, which is, and it's remarkable that they'll spend years at sea and they'll come back to the same beach. Um, however, tags don't tell the complete picture. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, firstly, you're generally only tagging the nesting turtles, which typically are females. Um, secondly, um, in order to sort of generate that spatial information, you need to get returns. And um, in a place like the Kimberley, which are very inaccessible, uh, uh, the extensive field activity that's required to do that is, is very difficult. So, um, so I'm a geneticist, and I'm, I'm going to give you a perspective, show you the, the perspective that genetics can provide. Um, to flesh out the story of, of where turtles will go. And my focus here is on the flatback turtles and green turtles in the Kimberley, but giving it a, a broader regional context as well. This project um, was contributed to by many people uh, in the present as well as the past. Collecting turtle samples is, um, is difficult. And um, so we're, we're relying on especially turtles um, coordinated through Nancy Fitzsimmons up in the top left, who's the legend of turtle genetics in Australia, and she's been and she's unable to be us with us today. So, to give you the sort of scientific context, we're interested in stocks, and stocks will be familiar to many of you. And really, what we're interested in is demographically um, cohesive units because they make a, a logical um, unit with which we can manage. Okay, so I, uh, we can they're, they're operating to an extent demographically independently of other such stocks. And as I mentioned before. Um, Genetics is widely applied as an ind indirect um, proxy for distinctiveness. So if you've got genetic distinctiveness between two regional samples, um, it's an indicator that some level of demographic independence. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of a background about uh, what we know about um, genetics and, and connectivity in flatbacks and, and greens uh, to set the scene for what, what we've done. Um, flatbacks typically are coastal species. Um, there's been some genetic work done on, on flatbacks by Nancy Fitzsimmons. Um, that's all unpublished, largely unpublished. Um, but what it has shown is that within Western Australia, at least, there's at least three genetically distinctive units or stocks. Um, the Kimberley, for many reasons, is, is sort of a hazy area there. We don't know much about the Kimberley stocks because it's so inaccessible. Uh, but what we do know, there's an interesting, um, interesting aspect of the biology, is that there's a shift between uh, on the Canning and Pilbara coasts, where um, flatback turtles are primarily winter nesting, sorry, summer nesting, and once you go past uh, Cape Levique, they're predominantly um, winter nesting. So that's an interesting life history shift, and how that is reflected in the in connectivity um, was a question of interest. So in terms, we, we, we're trying to address some of these questions. So this this map here shows you the, the yellow circles are what we, we recognize as stocks already. Um, there's a couple of question marks here because there's just sort of poor samples. And you see the Kimberley is, 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 is an unknown. We really don't know how it fits into the existing stocks, whether they are discrete stocks of their own. And so through um, the efforts of this project, as well as historical samples and a number of projects, those red dots represent where we collected samples, um, which we can lump into 17 sites, but there's actually sub-sites within them. Now, the other aspect of this project is that we've, um, we've employed the, the latest genetic techniques, um, genotype by sequencing, SNP markers. Now, what they're just offering us really is a much better coverage of the genome, potential to get a much finer resolution to the, the genetic distinctiveness of stocks. 
So the, well, the previous work has all been based on what's called mitochondrial or microsatellite DNA, which you might have come across. But for those technically interested, we, we end up with a thousand loci, which is about two orders of magnitude more than a typical study might have been ten, five years ago. Uh, and this map here just illustrates, uh, sort of, it's a zoom in to the Kimberley, again showing the samples, uh, the red dots. But this is the transition between uh, summer nesting and winter nesting, and I'll come back to that when we interpret the data. Same for the green turtles. So the green turtles, have, there's been a lot more work done on them, um, and, it, and it's published. And again, Nancy Fitzsimmons has been instrumental in this. It's not an endemic, the flatback was an endemic, but this is a globally distributed species, it's the iconic turtle you see in all the National Geographics. So the existing work's been based on mitochondrial DNA, a maternally inherited marker, and microsatellite DNA, which you, you've probably heard of them over the years. Um, and a lot of that was in the early days of genetic work in Australia, so some of it dates from the 90s and um, early 2000s. What was really interesting, and a, I guess a challenge to management of of green turtles in Western Australia, it was that there's was, there was one massive recognised stock but all the way between Ningaloo and the Lassapita Islands. So I don't know how many kilometres that is, but it's more than a thousand kilometres. And so that's, that, that seemed odd, even though turtles are capable of dis dispersing a long way, we do know that they tend to be, have strong fidelity to their nesting sites. And so the question was, well, is this just a reflection of when that work was done? It was in the early days and we just didn't have much resolution in the sorts of genetic markers we were using. The other um, element to stock structure in Western Australia is that green turtles nest on the offshore atolls like Ashmole Reef, Scott Reef, and so um, we already recognise that they are genetically distinctive, recognised stocks. Uh, we should thought we should include them as, as a regional context. We should include them when we're looking at, well, what are the affinities of the North Kimberley turtles with respect to those offshore atolls or the coastal um, stocks that we already recognise. So the green turtles, so the, the green, this is that huge stock between Northwest Cape and, and the Lassapit Islands. So they're, they're the recognised stocks within the Australian region. So through the Wainsey project, we um, gathered 125 samples and we added to that existing historical samples. 10 sites is where we focused our effort. And again, we used this uh, uh, next generation DNA sequencing to develop markers and we ended up with about twice as many markers, 2,000 SNPs. Okay, so I'm gonna cut straight to the results. Now, some of you will be familiar with this kind of plot. It's, it's a structure, is the, the name of the analysis, it's a clustering analysis. So what it's showing here is, if we say, we say, all right, these are all the turtles, and each turtle is represented by a vertical bar across the x-axis. And we'll say there's two groups of turtles here, and um, let's run a clustering analysis, and let's see where the turtles fall out. Do they fall out into cluster one or cluster two? And they're represented by whether they're orange or blue, arbitrary colours. So we're looking from the south all the way across northern Australia to Queensland. And you can see that there's a lot of blue. And then it shifts to orange once you get uh, east of Torres Strait. Um, I've also just illustrated here on, along the top the, the shift between um, summer and winter nesting. You can see there's a little bit of orange creeping in. From about here. Now that's when we assume that there's two groups, and this is what it looks like on a map, transposing it onto a map. So you can see, so that's a high level of the hierarchy. There's two strong genetic groups in green turtles, uh, sorry, in flatback turtles. Um, so southeast Queensland stands alone. But let's look down the scale a bit and let's say, okay, well, let's assume there's three groups in this data. So look at where turtles structure um, cluster out. And what you can see is again, the southeast Queensland ones, well, we know they're very different. And going from south to north, you can see, I don't know if it's just my eyes, but I think you could probably see that there's something that happens around about here, around about Eco Beach in the, in the Canning bioregion. Let's have a look at what that looks like on a map. But I think it's pretty obvious there's something happening around here. And if we transpose that onto a map, you can see this <coughs> Pilbara, Canning, Kimberley, Northern Territory. Yeah. And if we add another level, say there's four groups here, let's try to shuffle them into four groups, and actually it doesn't make any difference. It's more or less get the same story. So we sort of reach the bottom of the hierarchy that's sort of revealable through this analysis. That's pretty interesting because it coincides pretty nicely with this shift between summer and winter nesting. So take home messages. Strongest subdivision is east of Torres Strait. Um, and secondly, 
the second tier in the hierarchy of genetic subdivision is here, between Canning, Pilbara, and Kimberley. And what's interesting also is the Kimberley is more like, say, the Gulf turtles than they are than the Pilbara. We can actually drill down deeper into that, and this is a little bit difficult to read. It's a heat map of genetic, pairwise genetic difference between all of us, our sites. Take home message is that even within those groups, most nesting sites are genetically distinctive from each other. So um, these stars are significance level. So almost all of them have stars in, in this matrix. So most rookies are different. Okay, we'll shift to green turtles here. This is the same, exactly the same kind of analysis. So all these individuals across here, looking from south all the way over to Queensland. Big Lassipedes rookery here of interest. So existing work suggested that all of these were one big lump and could be treated as a sing single stock. So let's look at what that looks like on a map. Yes, so it shifts out to Queensland. We already knew that, that was, they were distinctive. Let's drill down, say, the three groups here. How, how did they split into three groups? Again, we're shifting out those Queensland ones. And unlike, I'd say, the flatbacks, there's not a clear distinctiveness. There seems to be, a, I guess, a, an isolation by distance. Now, what's interesting about this, these are those offshore sh at atolls. There's, there's the labels for them. So, so there's a, so as we knew, there's a genetic distinctiveness to those offshore atolls. There's a distinctiveness of the Coburg Peninsula, more or less. It's showing here, it's a little bit brown. But these, these are very subtle distinctions. What was interesting, what we were interested in was North Kimberley, Cassini. Unfortunately, we only had three, three um, samples, but you can see that it appears to be, have some sort of level of affinity to sort of the coastal Pilbara and Kimberley and, and also to the offshore shore. So we really need to look into that in a bit more detail. So the strongest subdivision is at Torres Strait. The second is that we think the Northern Territory Turtle, green turtles are distinctive. We think those offshore shoals are distinctive. And we also, and I'll emphasize that here, within that northwest stock, that existing stock that was recognized, um, this is the Lassipedes versus Northwest Cape and Barrow Island. There is a detectable level of genetic um, differentiation there. So we've, we've resolved that stock. It probably represents some degree of demographic uh, independence. <clears throat> So that's a new finding. What is interesting here is that all, all of these levels, this is a measure of genetic subdivision, they're much lower than in the flatbacks. So green turtles have much lower for the same uh, distance between rookeries than, than flatbacks do. So I'm just going to summarize. So we found a major subdivision in, in the flatbacks. And um, that's probably to do with climate change at, at Torres Strait. Secondly, there's that split at um, Cape Levique, and that probably less is related to nesting phenology. Um, but most sites were genetically distinct and recognisable as, as stocks. Green turtles, again, we found that major split at Torres Strait. And we also found a, a, a subtle genetic distinctiveness of Northwest Shelf. So it probably means that there's um, further stock structure that wasn't recognised. And we also confirmed that those offshore rookeries are distinct. Those North uh, Kimberley samples really need to be looked at more carefully, but we haven't got the sample size at this stage to resolve them. And that was interesting, this distinctiveness, this difference between the two species, implying higher connectivity generally in the flatbacks and probably lower abundances. I'll pass now on to Nikki. Okay, so we, Scott talked about one of the focuses of our project is to look at a risk that's threatened the Kimberley turtles. So the one we're going to focus on is the risk of climate change, which is a research question that our lab at the University of WA has looked at for some time on other um, WA sea turtle populations. So I'm going to be focusing particularly on the impact of higher beach temperatures on the sex ratios and survival of embryos. So our project, this is basically what I'm presenting is the work of uh, Blair Bentley, who's my PhD student. Jeff Stubbs was an honours student at ours, and Scott and I supervised both those students. So this project's actually kicked off probably five years ago with, with Jessica's work. And again, collaborators, these are the people who helped, you know, sat behind female turtles and grabbed eggs for us. So we've had similar um, kind of mix of collaborations across the project team, but in particular I wanted to acknowledge 
Mike Carney from University of Melbourne, whose models we're using to make some simulations about climate um, predictions for these stocks. And again, lots of engage engagement with Indigenous rangers who are helping with, with egg collections. So what I'm going to talk about is really three things. Firstly, kind of let's talk about the thermal environment of the Kimberley, because we actually know very little about that, and linking that to the nesting phenology that you've heard uh, Scott and or Tony and Ollie speak about. Looking at physiological thresholds for embryos, particularly what temperatures determine males and females, and how high can those temperatures go where embryos can survive. And then finally, putting those two things together to talk about climate change and it's what we think might happen in the sex ratio. Right, so what did we know before we start? Very little, okay? So this is a very difficult area to survey, as you know. So consequently, we had hardly any data on beach temperatures for the Kimberley zone. There's a bit of published data from Ashmore Island into the Northern Territory, the Bear Sand Island, a bit, a bit from Cape Domet. But essentially, the other temperature information for the Kimberley, I believe there's some out there. There's been a bit of ad hoc collection of, of putting people putting loggers in sand, but I haven't really seen that synthesised anywhere. So we really don't know what the sort of thermal trends across the Kimberley are. And the only way of really of inferring that at the moment is simply using you know, data from the Bureau of Meteorology to kind of infer what patterns we might see at the beach temperatures. So the first thing we really wanted to do was to um, really come up with a method to predict uh, beach temperatures, because that's really going to be the best way to do it at this scale. So in terms of a couple of hypotheses, we would expect the influence of obviously closer to the equator, you'd expect warmer beach temperatures. So if you're comparing the sort of summer and winter, or northern and um, southern rookeries, we'd expect to see warmer temperatures in summer in the north. But the other expect expectation, I guess, is that if we're comparing Southern rookeries in the sun in the summer with winter rookeries in the um, north, we probably expect a fairly equivalent temperature because sea turtles tend to choose beaches at a pretty consistent toasty temperature around 30 degrees, and we've got no reason to expect it's any different in the Kimberley. So let's see if our, our models actually um, bear out these predictions. So in terms of field methods, um, we set about putting out weather stations because the Kimberley is pretty poor, it's poorly serviced for um, uh, weather stations from the Bureau of Meteorology. They're in some of the major towns, but very few on the coast that are useful for modelling beach temperatures. So we tried to fill some of these gaps, again, using the aerial imagery. We picked where we thought the biggest densities were and targeted those for putting out weather stations. Some were longer term, like several year deployments, and some were just for a couple of months. We also started putting temperature loggers in the sand, wherever people could get to. A lot of the staff from this department were dropping loggers in the ground for us. And a lot of the staff were also collecting uh, sand samples that Tony regularly dropped off to us. So this is some of the variation in the sand colour of the Kimberley. So you've got things like those very sort of iron-rich sands from James Price Point through to these very white sands that you get on the, the island rookeries. So then using some, I'm not going to explain too much about the modelling, but we use this mod, well-known model now called Niche Mapper. It's a mechanistic model for predicting microclimates. And we forced that model with some site-specific data. So particularly we forced it with the particular reflectance of that beach, because that does affect how the heat transmits through the sand. And in particular, we forced it with different climate um, variables. And that's quite a challenge. What, what are the best variables to use for modelling? So we had a few options. If we had a weather station, then we would drive the model with the hourly data collected by our weather station on site. If we didn't have a weather station, though, we could turn to an alternative product, which is a CSIRO um, database called AWAP, Australian Water Availability water availability project. This is a gridded climate surface for Australia that goes back to 1990 on an hourly time scale. So we can run the models by pulling in a sort of a pixel, is it a 10, 10 kilometre resolution. And then more crudely, if we didn't have that information, say for some of the islands, we could use a global climate model, which is again a scale of about 50 kilometre pixels. So we tried these three different climate drivers to see how well they could simulate the sand temperatures. So we did this with 31 sites where we had the chance to compare the actual sand temperatures we measured at precise depths with the model that we predicted for that same depth. And this is just showing you one of those. So this is an example from the Cape Domet rookery where we've got data collected between November and July. So this grey data here shows the temperatures in the sand at this depth. This is what the model predicts. So this is showing what the model, if you're running it with that Australian Water Availability product, AWAP, that's the red line. If you're modelling it with that global surface, you can see it's the blue line, not so many bumps, and it's not a fine resolution. 
and here it is modelling it with the weather station data. So if you do some statistics on that, just ignore the green light. The purple is uh, a different type of model where we employed a routine around soil moisture. What we found was the best match is if we use the AWAP climate input and we didn't turn on that soil moisture uh, routine in the model, we could get a pretty decent match between sand temperatures and what the model forecasted there. So we're going to now, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to show you sort of the assumptions we're making about the Kimberley climate based on this CSIRO product driving the, the sand temperatures. Right, so these are the 31 or so sites where we've actually did some nice fine scale modelling. And what I'm comparing here is the temperatures in summer and winter. Now, when I say winter, winter is a, it's a bit of a generalisation. Winter is actually defined as August to the end of October, which is sort of the Cape Domit type uh, phenology in the north. And summer is defined as November through to the end of January. So we're looking at two snapshots of, of the average temperatures at 50 centimetres in the sand. And these are, so, these are simulated from 1990 right to, the tw to 2014, so about almost 25 years of, sim of simulation of those temperatures and then averaged. So what you can see is that um, we've, I've just overlaid the graph with um, what we sort of assume is a happy temperature for a sea turtle, which is around 29, 30 degrees. You can see in the winter, most of the beaches aren't achieving those sorts of temperatures. But here's um, Cape Domit here. This one does, okay, and that's a known winter rookery. And you can also see that um, there's about four to eight degrees difference in rookery temperatures between summer and winter. But it does depend a lot on the site. So that local climate is obviously influencing how, how different those beaches are between seasons. So hopefully I've sort of convinced you that you can get a fairly good understanding of the Kimberley thermal environment now by using this type of modelling approach. So I'm going to move away now from talking about the sand and what temperatures are underground to actually what the physiology is of the, of the, uh, the embryos that develop in these beaches. So again, what did we know before we started? Almost nothing again, because it's such a hard area to work on. So we had a, one of my earlier, um, my other student, Tegan Box, did a project on, on, the, on, the, last, on um, the Lambre Island in 2010, where she made an early estimate of the pivotal temperatures for the flatback turtle. And then the only other information we have is this recent paper, which was based on uh, the uh, flatback turtles from Cape York. So the other, we had two estimates of pivotal temperatures for, sea tur for the flatbacks from those two locations. But as you can see, the central, the Kimberley, we essentially haven't done this physiological work. Um, I'm going to assume the audience knows that sea turtles have temperature dependent sex determination. Okay, so males at uh, colder temperatures and females at warmer temperatures. And the methods we use to establish the particular um, the pivotal temperature for each population are, are methods that have been used for a long time. You simply have to get to those get to those rookeries, get the eggs back to an incubator as fast as you can, and which from the Kimberley is quite a challenge. You roughly have about three days from beach to incubator to have reasonably good viability. And as Tony inferred, he and Blair were often at these sites using a whole range of transport mechanisms to get these eggs back to a commercial flight back to Perth. Once they're in Perth at UWA, we've got six incubators there, so we, we use roughly between 28 and 33 degrees, and then hatch them out, they sacrificed at hatching, and then using histology, we can look at the gonads to determine if we've got males and females. All right, so I'm gonna talk about what we've learnt for the green turtle. So our big collection site for greens was on the West Lassipede Island, and this is just a simple, a, a very, uh, familiar plot to those who work on TSD, just shows you the relationship between incubation temperature and the proportion of males produced. So there's a threshold function going from all males at cool temperatures to all females at higher temperatures. So pivotal temperature for that population is 29.4 degrees. That's pretty similar to the Queensland um, uh, green turtles. But the, the nice thing about the green turtle is there's a lot of temperatures that produce males and females. So that's called the transitional range of temperatures. And that's quite a useful feature if you're concerned about climate change to have many temperatures that produce both sexes. The other thing we did was modelling. Uh, what we tried to use is a non-linear modelling approach to infer the upper thermal limit of, of sea turtles. And what we showed for um, this species, it's about 34 degrees. So this is the uh, predictions for the Lassipede Islands. This is the same data I showed you before, summer and winter temperatures. So just overlaying the pivotal temperature sits there. So you can see that that's 
um, below the typical summit temperature on the lacepedes. And in terms of the upper thermal limit, my plot's actually switched over there a bit, but that's um, about here. So currently the sand temperatures and the, and the lacepedes don't look particularly challenging for, for green turtles, so it looks like a nice suitable site under the current climate. Okay, so for the flatbacks, we've had ambitions to sample I think 12, up to 12 sites in the Kimberley and do this work for lots and lots of rookeries. In the end, it was only feasible to do it for a winter and a summer nesting stock, but I think that's probably been enough. So what we did is we worked up at Cape Dunlop and we worked at 80 Mile Beach. And again, just showing you, we have pivotal temperature estimates. The one for the northern site, Cape Dunlop, is lower, 29, sorry, it's, yes, it's, yeah, it's right, it's lower. It's 29.5, so the winter nesting's got a slightly lower <coughs> pivotal temperature than the summer nesting population at 80 Mile Beach. And again, we've inferred the um, upper thermal limits be about 33, nearly 34 degrees. So overlaying these things here, pivotal temperatures, so you can see at Cape Domet, the pivotal temperature is quite close to the winter temperatures there. Um, and again, the upper thermal limit of this population is getting again quite close to the summer temperatures at Cape Domet. So now we're going to put those bits of information together. We can mechanistically predict sand temperature. We know something about the thermal physiology of the embryos of two species and two stocks for the flatbacks. So now we're going to sort of try and make some simulations of what happens under a current climate and under a future climate. So we've got this model. This is the niche mappers model of driving the microclimate. So we can use the historical climate surfaces from CSIRO to run that model. And we can also adjust those according to future climate scenarios. So adding on some extra heat to the air temperatures to simulate sand temperature. And we can then use that, that not sand reflectance values to adjust those as well. So we've got nest temperature predictions. And for our purposes, I'm going to predict temperature at about 50 to centimetres, which is a sort of a kind of near the bottom of a flat back nest and probably about the centre of a green turtle nest because they nest slightly deeper. And then we have a, a model that describes the physiology of embryonic development, which I won't spend too much time talking about, except to say we had to work out a lot of this from, from scratch, including things like when in development the gonads are differentiating into testing and ovaries. That was Jess Stubson's first project that kicked this, this whole Ponzi project off. So then we can basically customise these parameters for each rookery. So we can run the unique version of the climate model and then we'll parameterise the physiological model with the parameters we've got for the right uh, species or the right stock of the flatbacks. So here is our predictions for the West Lacepedes Islands. So that's just the reference, same data you saw before. This is just a simulation using the AWAP climate data of what the sex ratio would be between 2013 and 2017 if the female laid her egg on a particular day. So if she laid on January 1 here, the sex ratio is pretty well um, close to a strong female bias, maybe 10% females, um, and so on. So basically, whatever the day of the year is, that predicts what the sex ratio would be a couple of months later. So the grey just shows you the shading is where they tend to nest now. That's the nesting phenology. So you can see that they're nesting in the summer, which is when they're producing predominantly female offspring. So it looks like the latter peas, we would probably get it's a a female bias rookery, and that's quite common for sea turtles. Um, but if you, if you can see, if they switch to winter nesting now, that would be a producing male offspring. All right, so let's look at some climate change scenarios now for the, for the green turtles. So these plots are slightly they're different. I'll again talk you through them. The black line is the average temperature each day at 50 centimetres in the sand average from 1990 to 2000, so a 10-year average essentially. And then these are simulated sand temperatures by under a 2030 climate where we've roughly got about a degree and a half of warming and it's a maximum, it's a conservative and a less conservative uh, climate scenario. So in terms of what happens with sex ratios, the answer is not much. There's a slightly more feminization in the future at, at, at um, the latter fees, but really it's pretty similar to what we see today. But let's by, by 2070, so under this simulation, we've added up to five degrees to the sand, to the air temperatures, which has increased the sand temperatures, and you can start to see the effect that has on sex ratio. So here, this is the current situation and the current sex ratio prediction. This shows how that would differ under a five degree warming by 2070. So you can see 
many much more time in the year could only produce females and they'd have to be switching to sort of late autumn, early spring to capture times where males are being produced. But we don't see such a marked change in the green turtle because they've got that broad range of temperatures that produces both sexes. So that's why you don't see such abrupt transitions as you're going to see in the next species. All right, so in terms of now we're looking at flatbacks and we're going to compare the winter nesting population at Cape Domet um, with the one in the south at 80 Mile Beach, the summer nesting one. So here's Cape Domet, again, just predicting the sex ratio depending on the day of the year the female laid her eggs. You can see where they currently nest now, which is roughly August through to November. They if they nest early, they're capturing a time of year when they're producing males, mixed sexes, and then they go to a sort of more female dominant production later in the nesting season. Um, in the south, though, quite a different pattern from 80 Mile Beach. So their nesting is in summer, and again, they're predicting the model at 50 centimetres predicts, again, mostly female offspring. So yeah, again, again, both rookeries are supporting, predominantly the model suggests females are being produced, but Cape Dolman in particular seems to be quite an important area for male production, and that's actual, our only publication so far focuses on that point as Cape Dolman being one of the few rookeries where males seem to be um, yeah, produced in good numbers. So in terms of climate change predictions now for the flatback turtle, now I'm just showing you the sex ratio plots, and I'm showing you 80 Mile Beach, Cape Dolman under the two climate futures, a 2030 climate and a 2070 climate. And I think probably the most interesting thing to look at is this one here. So this is Cape Domet in 2070. Under a five degree warming, there is no way at Cape Domet that males can be produced anymore. It's an entirely feminised rookery. If, it, if the climate scenario is a little bit less, um, less heat, then they're going, they're going to be able to produce some um, males if they nest a bit earlier in the winter. But the problem really is, is because their winter nesting population, a phenology, a phenology shift to a, to a cooler time of year is not really possible if you're already nesting in winter. Whereas if you're a summer nesting population, shifting to earlier nesting is going to counteract extreme skews in sex ratios. All right, okay. So I guess what to, to try and wrap all this up a bit, is that we've got this nice, the data that Ollie is showing was showing this sort of suggestion of genetic structure in the flatback turtle across the Kimberley between the summer and nesting populations. So I suspect that's probably driven this divergence in the physiological thresholds as well, which is what our, our work on the pivotal temperature suggested. And probably for the greens, we didn't see that same genetic structure across the Kimberley, which probably means that the work we've done with that Lassipede Island sample is probably going to be a good proxy for modelling a green turtle rookery at any other location in the Kimberley. In terms of sort of risk analysis, then I think probably what the model is showing that if those winter nesting populations, if we do get that sort of large increase in ambient temperatures, we're going to be looking at a situation of predominantly only females being able to be produced. So if males are not coming in from elsewhere to breed with those females, we'd probably predict over a very long time frame a decline in winter nesting populations in the Kimberley. I think one thing I haven't touched on at all, though, that's probably even more important than sex ratio bias is direct mortality as the beach temperatures go up and we see more extreme sort of heat wave events. And that's actually been another focus of Blair's PhD, which I haven't touched on. He's also been doing transcriptomics and heat shock experiments and looking at gene expression across these, all these populations to try and understand um, just what sort of molecular options that sea turtle embryos have to adapt to extra heat. But I think I'm going to hand back to Scott now. So we'll have to go fast because we're already slides. over an hour. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just, just two slides. Yeah. Um, I'd just like to uh, take the opportunity to, I guess, extend my thanks to the leads of each of the projects. So Tony for, for his component uh, on distribution, um, Ollie and Nancy for the genetics, and Nikki and Blair. For, you know, it was an ambitious project at the start, and, and we seem to have come through it um, pretty well at the end. So, um, just a quick one, you know, we, we've had a lot of meetings with managers, so this is the, the departmental managers. We had 44 sort of meetings with Indigenous managers, 32 field trips, uh, 20 media, uh, radio and, and print um, things. We had 28 conference presentations. Uh, we've had, only had one peer-reviewed paper published at the moment. There are four others expected, um, field reports and, and posters. And I guess the, just the five take-home um, messages from all of this is that we've had regional scale 
nesting distribution map for the Kimberley, which is it's over 12,000 kilometres, is a, is a pretty big feat. Uh, the gen genetic stocks have been defined for flatbacks and greens, and we've still got uh, some hawksbills to do in the future. The pivotal temperatures uh, have been determined uh, for flatbacks and greens, and we've got a mechanistic, a mechanistic model produced for predicting climate change impacts. The engagement and training for for 11 Indigenous Ranger partners, that was a big plus for all of us. I think that was a, was a big outcome. And then really we've got the completion of a regional scale project with local, regional and national scale advice and implications. And we've feed, been feeding directly into the National Recovery Plan and feeding directly into um, the departmental um, uh, advice as well. So that's it from us. Scott and all presenters. Um, I realise we're over time. If you definitely need to go, please let me understand. Otherwise, if there's any questions for any of the presenters. So if you need to go, feel free to take off. Um, anyone that wants to stay and ask questions for a couple of minutes, if there's any questions for any of the... Um, great, great set of talks, guys. Uh, thanks a lot. I've got, a, I guess, a high level tough question, and I'm not coming to make it. With the large amount of good work that's been done now, have you got the conflict from that the, the key, I guess the key for, for long lived species is long term monitoring, and, and that is the key for global development as well. So, this is really the start, and we probably didn't touch on this enough, is this is the, the base level to identify areas that are going to be key potential monitoring sites, or so there could be some potential gaps. But for each of these ones, usually we're looking at um, one to two nesting rookeries in any one stock to have a, a monitoring site. And now we've got the stocks identified, we've got all the nesting locations, you can now start to work with the Indigenous Rangers and the local uh, departmental rangers to look at what would be feasible for setting up uh, long-term monitoring, either, and, and that can be scalable as well. So you start off every you know, track counts or go off to tech programs. So I think that's where we'll be heading for longer-term um, confidence. If anyone else wants to add to that. Um, yeah, I've got a question about the climate change. I think that temperature stuff is very impressive. But what is intriguing me is that many of these places are islands backed by rocks, small pocket beaches where some of this nesting is taking place. And I really think you should just do some simple modeling with sea level rise and erosion because in 50 years you probably look at 50 meters of erosion. Um, many of those beaches may not actually exist, so maybe we should concentrate our efforts on places where beaches will still exist. Yeah, that's an excellent idea. We haven't we haven't counted the sea level change at all. I think Scott's work. Is I mean, it's very simple modelling, but you could do it yeah. like an envelope. But yeah, that's right. Yeah. But, you know, in that as well, there'll be some beaches that will be eroded, and there'll be other beaches that will be formed as well, and that's the other part of that. Uh, <laughs> not on the island. Yeah. There'll be there'll be some other places. The main the green too. I sort of did shake a hit when he started to quite But um, the offshore uh, islands, you know, uh, of the Kimberley, have only emerged since the last high sea level in the last four or five thousand years. So they've been actually colonised from somewhere else. Who would have known the land bridge across Torres Strait didn't open until six thousand years ago, and the flooding into the upper Carpentaria went from the west, so some of the pathways where turtles um, actually redistributed, and then you think you're coming down the West Australian coast, you look at the dimetry and all those sort of things, is probably the expansion south where the Barrow Island alignment has happened you know, quite recently, and the biggest one is, of course, only 20,000 years ago. And where there was actually any exposed Beach of any sort. It's all part of the knowledge of that geology. It's a question. Oh, you know, I just had a question about the genetic um, <coughs> side of things. You were saying for the flatbacks, there seem to be a lot of um, um, population differentiation throughout the Kimberley. And I was just wondering how, given their site fidelity in terms of nesting, firstly, whether that makes them more vulnerable to any particular localised disturbances that might. You know, they cause a loss or change in their nesting habitat. And then also whether we know whether their foraging zones are also as, you know, 
restricted or defined, and, and again, whether if we were to lose the turtle nesting side of that population, whether there would be any flow on ecological effects of the, the role within that foraging area. Yeah, so good question. Uh, the first, first one, I think that's the sort of the logical basis of stocks, in that if you've got something that's more genetically discreet, you know, that's the, the advantage of the small scale because it's affected by more local processes. Mm -hmm. um, the second one, um, I, don't, I don't think the genetics in this literature gives us insight. That's where telemetry card work comes into it, and isotope work, which shows the sort of spatial scale of origin. Um, and we'll, we'll kind of just dabble a little bit on that answer because that's really part of the Northwest Shelf Flatback Turtle Project, Conservation Project, and we have done a variety of uh, satellite telemetry across the Pilbara and Kimberley, and we have turtles, at, uh, you call it a big spot margin here. So yeah. most of the Kimberley turtles are in the Kimberley, but yeah. some in the Pilbara, some of the Pilbara turtles are up in the Kimberley, and you know, right. so, so they can see a more direction. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, right. okay. Small comment to a question. The bit that I'm interested in, what does this body of knowledge mean for inferring uh, populations of the same species located elsewhere in the Chamber C area? Because the bit that I'm interested in is where we don't have data, can we use the beach temperatures or the beach um, insulation uh, information to uh, infer the security of both beaches for those species of nesting and thereby extrapolate the potential distribution of similar species? Because a lot of work that we do is in areas that's not surveyed or where there's not data, for example, Timor and Indonesia, and what have you. Is there a way for us to link? The performance of a population to the temperature of the beach, the temperature of the area, because temperature is easy to measure, or much easier to measure and cheaper to measure than uh, deploying a survey over a 12 month period uh, in Eastern Timor. Do you want to start? Yeah, well, I mean, using a mechanistic model, you can forecast <coughs> beach temperature anywhere in the world, so yeah. again, if you prove it works in one place, it should work in the other, and you can drive it with the right local. So yeah, I can say you do that pretty cheaply once you've got yeah. the sand collected. But, yeah. the link but the linking, it to the, linking it to the pop, what the population is doing, that's a bit of a, a long way to draw. Yeah. So, so um, I, I guess the other thing from that is that for the turtle nesting in any one location, um, temperature isn't the only factor. It's even the beaches we think are quite suitable for turtles, but the temperature and slope and everything else, sometimes they're not selecting those beaches to nest on. So even for the Kimberley, we have very little knowledge. Our best way of understanding who was where it was to fly it, you know, and, and so that was the quickest way, the quickest snapshot we could get of looking at where the importance was. Once we found those, then you could probably select and, and make it a smaller scale project to go into those two or three beaches that you think are really important. Um, and for a sea body, you fly around in about three or four hours, as I recollect. So it, 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 it could be the, the quickest way, of, and then using all these other things, uh, transferable. Thanks, guys. I think we might wrap it up there, but I think that's certainly what Scott and everyone's presented shows you how iconic turtles are in this space. They capture everyone from the indigenous groups and their interest in from cultural and food perspectives. As Wolf always said, the media the politicians love to release a satellite tag turtle. So it, it really covers all that space. So as an iconic species, an iconic group for um, conservation, it's a really powerful tool going forward. So all of the uh, information that Scott and the group have presented will be available on the WOMSI website. Uh, they'll be presented again at the symposium at the end of this year, which is at the end of November. And that information is on the website as well, along with all the other projects. Uh, and we're sort of wrapping it up towards the end of the year. Um, so that sort of everything, even this talk is available. So if you want to, Kelly's been taking this talk, it'll be available on the WOMSI website as well. So if you want to forward it on to other people to see what's actually happened today, you can feel free to do that as well. Um, so just to finish off, we'd like to thank all the presenters today for.